Okay, my name is Gary Treasure. I am a family and mindset coach. That means that I help families with their mindset towards their relationships with each other and their relationship with self. The reason why I do it is because I'm good at it, apparently, um, because I love doing it. It's not a hat that I put on and take off when the working day is finished. It's something that I do whether I'm at work or whether I'm in the company of friends or family. Right. Um, it's, it's the no-brainer for me to, be, to decide to be a coach after having been a youth worker and family support worker for 20 plus years. I won't say exactly how long. Right, right. But 20 plus. 20 plus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so that means you know what you're doing a little bit. You might know a little bit about it. I've been doing it for quite some time. Um, I love it with a passion, to yeah. be honest. Um, and I've had quite a few successes. Um, I don't like to leave clients not feeling happy with their outcome. Um, but at the same time, I do encourage clients to put the work in. I can't be working harder than the clients. But at the same time, I do seem to have a way of helping my clients to put the work in. Right. I'm very laid back um, in my approach to how I work, how I live my life. You know, I'm very laid back. Some people say if I was any more laid back, I'd be lying down. <laughs> but um, people seem to like that because it encourages people to be able to come out of themselves and, yeah. and talk about things they wouldn't ordinarily feel comfortable about talking about. I can raise my hand on that one. Okay, so what's the name of your business? The business is called Manifest Coaching. The reason why it's called Manifest Coaching is because I want people to understand just from the title of the business is that you want to manifest your future. You want to manifest your dreams. Right. You want to manifest your goals. You want to set goals and then use the right strategies that are going to get you to achieve those goals. Sometimes, in many cases, looking to surpass those goals. Right. So that's what we're looking to do. Manifest your destiny. Manifest the greatest you. Manifest the greatest family connection you can have. Right. So manifest greatness that you are. I like that. Okay, so you got a slogan? The slogan is, when home is right, everything else becomes much easier. I understand, I understand why mm. that makes sense, but why, why did you choose that as a slogan? Um, and do it, you live by it? Absolutely. It, it, part of the reason why I chose that as a slogan is because having the experience, I'm in a 17 year long marriage, and like any marriage, there's ups and downs. So when we're having our downs, Anything outside of home seems like it's, it doesn't have that polish to it. When home is right, when me and my wife are vibing, when me and my kids are good, everything else, it doesn't matter how everything else is actually going. I just feel that I can fix everything. I can do anything. Anything that I have in my head as a dream that I want to achieve, I can do it because I've got the backing of my home. Exactly. Now we're going to get a little more personal. Mm -hmm. So where are you from originally and, and where are your ancestors from? So I'm from North London, England. And my great, my grandparents and my parents are from Jamaica. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, have you lived anywhere else uh, other than England and, of course, Africa? Um, I actually took my family from England to Canada. Um, I was there for 10 years. Um, we moved from England because we, I never felt at home in England. I know I was born there, but it's never really felt home. So <clears throat> I took my family to Canada um, in search for that feeling. There was still something missing. As a result of something being missing, I kept searching. And so here I am in Gambia at this point. Okay, okay. So, uh... So you were saying that you felt something missing. So, mm -hmm. so that would be the reason why you moved to Africa. Yeah, That's yeah. Part of the reason. One of the reasons for sure. Um, 
part of the reason why I moved as well is because in the West, there are certain things you can say and certain things you can't say. So, you know this where they talk about their cancel culture? Every, they're trying to decide not only what you say, but what you think and how you think. And I'm not cool with that, um, especially because my culture is one where we say what's on our mind. And, you know, people don't necessarily always like what's being said, but we get through it. So we kind of work as a family. Everybody wants to say what they've got to say. We get upset with each other. We shout and we scream and everything. But after that, we go and we eat together, right? We can do that here in Africa can't do that in the West because okay. someone will get so upset they'll take away your ability to eat they'll take away your job something that for me my job I love my job yeah. I don't ever see myself retiring from it right, right? It's, so it actually doesn't become work for me it's just part of my life right. so the idea that if I'm in the West someone could potentially take away my life from me no, I'll, I'll do Africa in a hobby. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what about your experience as a man mm -hmm. moving to Africa? As a man moving to Africa... Um, what your experience has been like? Yeah, yeah. it's been challenging. Definitely it's been challenging because what I do for a living isn't really here in Africa. So me as being a quite a traditional man who likes to see myself... And, you know what, I'm in a traditional relationship. My wife likes to look at me as being the head of the home. I like to look at myself as being the head of the home. That doesn't mean that what I say goes 24-7, but it does mean when things are not going well, I'm supposed to be the rock that holds everything together, right? If I'm not earning money here, but my wife is earning money here, that challenges my manhood. Right. But because, at this... because, because... We, we looked at it as the providers. Right. right, yes. But my reality is, at the same time, I'm like, I can be here in Africa and be a man, as opposed to being a black man. My color is irrelevant here. What people will more say here is, oh, you're Sirihuli, or you're Jolas, or you're um, Mandinka, Mandinka, and so on and so on, right? But I'm claimed here. Whereas in the West, I've been told, go back to where you come from. Right. So I, I feel very homely here. I, I'm at home. I can feel, oh, this is my brother. We might not see eye to eye. They might do, do things slightly different to what I'm, ex what I'm used to. But as a man, I'm home. I've got something that I can build on. Here. So this is what I'm, I'm in the process of doing, where I'm trying to help Africans to and Gambians, it's not just uh, Gambians because there's a lot of Africans from other nations here as well. Create an opportunity for them to explore who they are and for us to start getting back to where our history was before, the greatness that we had, to have a level of education that surpasses where we've been, to have a level of understanding and awareness of self that surpasses where we've been, to look at our queens and, and hold them in reverence. This to me is part of being a man, yeah. because it doesn't matter what your experience, if being a man, you should be able to stand up. Don't care how low you go. So for instance, I will run a group and some men will be reluctant to engage or to participate in the group. But the reason for the group is, is for you to be able to have an opportunity to engage and to speak what is comfortable for you. But I like to create an environment that says, you know what, whatever happens in this group stays in this group. It doesn't go outside of the group. Yeah. So when people come to me, we have the opportunity to really dig deep in ourselves. We don't look at, my concern is not what happens with other people. So instead of the group set talking about, oh, he did this or she did that, we're not doing that. Right. We look at how did I feel when this, my experience was this? How did I handle it? And, it, and when you do that, you get vulnerable because you're, you're really talking about yourself, you're digging deep in yourself. And when we do that, we make ourselves vulnerable. But in that vulnerability, how do we respond? Do we react when someone 
said something we don't like, or do we respond? Do we develop strategies that are going to enable us to take a step back, pause? How did this person really mean this? Is it about them or is it about me? Right. So, this is our self analysis. So, piggybacking off of this a little bit more. Mm. So, do you believe that men should speak with other men? Like, do you believe that we should congregate? 100%. 100%. We need to. Um, when we congregate as men and we start sharing our experiences, um, we can gain support from each other. We can feel that this next guy, he's experienced the same kind of thing as me. And so um, not only are we gaining support, we're sharing information that's going to help somebody else. So at the same time as receiving support, we give support. Um, I think it's important for us because what we've been through, um, doesn't matter where we are in the West, we're going to have stories that are all similar. How many, and it doesn't matter whether, we, in fact, not even just in the West, when you come back to Africa, how many of us have heard, shut up before I give you something to cry about? <laughs> right? How many of us have been experienced getting beaten? Yeah. Whether it be excessively or whether it just be what you believe you, you know, I was a little bit naughty there, yeah. so I just kind of got what I deserved. Yeah. We all are going to be able to turn around and say, that's a familiar experience. Yes. So, in us gathering together, it's an opportunity to share, it's an opportunity to grow. Right. So, uh, do you feel that, because earlier when you were speaking, you were saying like, how, you know, one of the problems may be that the information will get out, because men are very private. Mm -hmm very private yep. no matter what we're doing sneaking around any, it's like yep. we try to do everything in privacy and keep it in mm -hmm. because for one the world tell us to keep it in right, right? and so do you feel like that's uh, one of the main issues or do you feel like it's ego or I feel like we can say it's ego but I think it's mainly fear fear that we are not going to be able to respond to someone knowing stuff about us that makes us feel vulnerable the fear that someone's going to take our information and try and use it against us and view us as being weak but for me when you're when you gather as men it's an opportunity to be vulnerable when you're vulnerable you encourage other people to do the same right the the fact of of um, someone letting you down when you're vulnerable means you're maybe you may be low and someone may well have their foot on your neck but it's like what do you do with that are you going to be man enough to really turn around and stand up and be a man regardless of that is your integrity going to stay intact are you going to still be able to say you know what alright everybody knows all of my business but I'm going to do what i got to do anyway by the time you've done that and you've been through that process, everybody knows you're a man. Right. You know you're a man, which is the most important thing. Right. You know how to respond to this situation. Whereas if you never get vulnerable, you don't know. And so you remain scared. But when you, it's for instance, like if, if a person's been shot and they're still alive, they know they can survive being shot, so their fear is diminished, exactly. right? Exactly. When I got robbed years ago, um, and I'm still here, I know that I can be, I can go through that kind of situation. I'm still standing up as a man. Right. I can still provide for my family. Yeah. I can still provide for myself. Exactly. And that, exactly. for me, is a big thing that we get from engaging as men and standing up as men. So. Okay, so now, because I don't want to be on the men too hard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little about your experience as far as bringing a family here overall. That's an interesting one in sense of, in general, kids never ask to travel from right. the West. Right. They, they don't have an opinion. Right. And so um, my son, who is now 15, we didn't really ask him, we more told him, this is where we're coming, right? right? 
And so you have to deal with the fallout of that. Your child may well say, you know what, over and over again, I want to go back to the West. But you know, if he goes to the West, every, his whole education is going to be stigmatized with um, the idea of you're black, so you're less than. Because the education systems over there are not built so that you can be recognized on the same level, right? Um, so bringing my son and my daughter here um, in itself is challenging because now I've got to think of them right. as well, Child right? One hundred percent. But I know for sure that just as I'm a uh, just a man here, as opposed to a black man, my children are now children as opposed to black children. Right. So um, I know there's that I I just need to support them through this process. Yeah. If they still want to go back to the West at some point, that's fine. Yeah. But they've already had the opportunity to be just a child. Right. They've already had the opportunity to be just a boy or an adolescent. Not a black adolescent, not a black boy. Not And as a boy in the West, um, we all know when they talk about, if they say that's a boy, it's a white boy. If they say, if they're talking about a black boy, they're going to express that he's a black boy. And that black boy will get treated as if he's an adult if he does anything kind of wrong. I've already experienced a similar kind of thing with my son. And he was much younger. 